Well, thank you all for who have joined our Zoom Seed Library meeting. It's definitely different, but I'm glad you all could could uh, make the time to do this. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Brandy. She's going to talk about uh, how to do uh, cross pollination prevention. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat, and we will get to them at the end. All right, Brandy. All right, thanks. Um, I was just making sure everybody's muted. I want to let you guys, we are uh, recording this just so that we can post the recording on the library's webpage afterwards so that folks can still um, get the information from the from the C library. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Brandy Pethel. I'm the Master Gardener Extension Volunteer with Jackson County. And um, Basically, I, I have a, just a little bit of information about what Cooperative Extension is. Um, um, our mission is to extend lifelong learning to Georgia citizens through unbiased research-based education in agriculture, the environment, communities, and youth and families. And um, Extension is a collaboration between Georgia County governments, the USDA, the University of Georgia's Colleges of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, and Family and Consumer Sciences. And then lastly, the Master Gardener Extension Volunteer Program. Um, we are all volunteers. We assist Cooperative Extension by, um, well, the program assists by training Master Gardener volunteers, so that's me, to provide unbiased horticulture information to Georgians through volunteer community service, educational gardening projects, um, using applied research and the resources of the University of Georgia. Um, so that's just kind of a, a brief overview of what Cooperative Extension is um, and what the Master Gardener program is. So um, I have an email address at the end of the presentation, so, and it's also on the Jefferson C Library webpage. Um, there are a, a lot of parts in this presentation that are specific to the Jefferson C Library, but there's a wealth of information that you can apply um, to gardening regardless of, of where you live and um, whether you are an active participant in the Jefferson Seed Library. So um, kind of what we're going to go through today is an overview of pollination basics. Those of you that have seen my um, presentation before will recognize a lot of the same slides. Um, this is just that that overview. I even need this overview again and again sometimes so I think it's good to to refresh all our memories on um, how pollination works and, and what all the uh, fancy names of the types of flowers are. We're going to go through some types of plants, kind of general groupings of plants, and then um, we'll actually get down to some details and start talking about some specific plants and uh, pollination risks, I guess you want to call with it. So First, flowers and pollination. So the first thing we've got um, are self-pollinating flowers. I've got to move my, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I had to move my face out of the way because I couldn't, couldn't see the slide. Um, so self-pollinating flowers, oh, there we go. Um, they're also called perfect flowers because they have both the male and female parts inside the same flower. So um, the structures, often discourage pollen from other plants. So if you can see, this is a little pea blossom here. Um, the petals are kind of folded in on itself and it's got all, all the male and female parts are inside those petals. It's not really set up for pollination to happen and exchanging pollen between plants. So if you see something that's listed as a perfect flower, a self-pollinating flower, um, that's what that means, that it's not going to, um, it's not set up for, say, a bee to come and pick up pollen. Um, here's kind of a cross section of one of these flowers. This is a pea flower, so you can see the, the little peas down there in the bottom of the flower. So because of the way those petals are wrapped around the anthers and the stigma, you're not going to get wind or, like I said, a bee getting in there to um, move the flowers or move the, the parts around, move the pollen over to the uh, stigma. Um, some of these flowers, they still do attract bees and the bees will land on them to drink the nectar, but they're really pollinating by buzz pollination. So you may see bumblebees land on a flower and they buzz their wings. Um, they're shaking the flower and what's happening is they're drinking some nectar and they're pollinating, self-pollinating that plant. Um, so they're not bringing and transferring pollen. 
Um, Cross-pollinating flowers, uh, they're going to have the big wide open flowers and they're going to encourage pollination um, by att either attracting insects to come and pick up pollen and move it, or they're going to be pollinated by the wind, um, which none of us, of course, or we don't have control over insects either, but um, you have no control over, over wind pollinated plants. Um, these flowers can be monoecious, so that means separate male and female flowers on the same plant. Um, or they can be dioecious, which there's a male plant and a female plant. Um, male pollen, or the pollen, which is, comes from the uh, male parts of the plant, has to go to the female part of the plant in order for it to produce a fruit. So here on the screen, you can see two squash, squash blooms. On the left is the, the one with the skinny stem. It, that is the male flower. And then the squash flower that has almost like a little tiny baby squash at the base of it is the female flower. Um, on squash in particular, you'll see the uh, male flowers open up before the female flowers. Um, and that's intentional um, to have the pollen moving around whenever that female flower opens up and is ready to receive pollen. Um, these flowers grow in the same plant, so you don't have to plant, you know, you're not trying to plant a female squash plant and a male squash plant or anything like that. Um, an example of a dioecious plant would be the mulberry tree. Uh, there's red mulberries that we have native here. Oh, we like this one. I'm sorry. Oh, I gotta mute somebody. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh oh, let me go back to that. So the uh, mulberry tree has, um, it's a male tree and a female tree. Um, and unless you have a female tree, you won't have any, um, you won't have any, any fruits unless you have a female. All right. So this is just a little kind of separate visual about male and female. Um, this is dioecious, male and female plants. So we need little colors to kind of show the, that they are actually two separate plants. The perfect flower has, like I said before, male and female on the same flower. And then The monoecious has male and female flowers on the same plant, but they are actually separate flowers. So I hope that that visualization there helps, helps with the difference between dioecious, monoecious, and perfect flowers. Um, here's a, 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 another visual example of a cross-pollinating flower. So most of us, uh, remember or have some memory of back in school whenever we were learning about bees picking up pollen from one flower and flying to another and that they are dropping off that pollen. Um, you can go outside and watch the bees and you can see the pollen sacks hanging on their legs and see that, see that happening. Um, this is one of the, the risks to uh, any, any plant that's attracting insects um, because that pollen is going to be moving around uh, between plants. Um, if it's moving between different plants, different species, it really doesn't, doesn't matter any. It, it matters to the bee because the bee is collecting that pollen, but as far as the reproduction of a plant, it's not going to affect it if they're different plants. Um, but we'll see towards the end of the presentation where the um, Brassica loracea um, plant, which produces, which is a good deal of our um, broccoli and cabbage and kale and kohlrabi, it's all the same species. So um, collecting seeds from that species in particular is difficult if you have many of them growing at one time. All right, so kind of again, why does it matter? If a plant is not self-pollinating, it's gonna be susceptible to cross-pollination. So, um, those of you who do save, save seeds, you may have seen if you plant two kinds of squash near each other. So these are two different varieties. Um, you may have green squash and yellow squash, okay? And if they bloom at the same time, so they have flowers open and they're, they're receptive to pollen at the same time, 
and you have a bee visit the yellow squash and then the bee goes and visits the, the green squash, it could very well drop off some of that pollen from that yellow squash in to the green squash female flower. What's gonna happen is it's gonna produce a green, a green squash, a green zucchini, just like you would expect. It's not gonna taste any different. You're not gonna know anything different about it. What's gonna happen is if you then save the seeds from that green zucchini squash that was pollinated by a yellow squash, so male pollen from the yellow squash is what told the squash, okay, produce fruit and seeds, those seeds inside that zucchini squash are going to be a uh, franken squash is kind of what we like to call it. Um, it's going to be kind of, it's going to be strangely colored on the outside or strangely shaped. It may be shaped like a yellow squash, kind of big on the bottom and skinnier on the top, but be green on the outside. Or um, you may not even, you know, the seed, I'm talking the seeds that come from the green squash, green zucchini when you grow them the next season. So this is a long-term, a long-term thing. <laughs> I wanna make sure I clarify that. Um, so the, the seeds that come out of that green squash that you, that you say, you may have eaten some of it and saved some of the seeds. Um, that squash is going to not be a green squash or a yellow squash. It's gonna be some kind of weird mix between the two. Um, this can happen with melons, like I said, with, um, the brassica laracea, so kale and cabbage, if they're flowering at the same time, they can cross and you can get some really strange uh, franken kale or franken cabbage um, type of child from the seeds of, of before. Um, and there are some plants that are gonna cross with wild varieties. So carrots are very, very closely related to Queen Anne's lace. So when you see that blooming up on the roadsides, if your carrots are blooming at the same time, there's a really good chance that you can have some cross-pollination happening. And what that's gonna do is when you save those carrot seeds that are in your garden, you plant them, they're gonna grow and not be the same kind of carrot that you, um, you had out of your garden before that produced those seeds. Um, and the solution to this is to refer to isolation guidelines. So we're gonna get into that here in a few minutes. Um, there's a couple different types of plants and, and definitions, some words that you're going to see on the front of a seed packet. So we're just going to go over those really quick. Um, open pollinated plants, these kind of seeds are safe for seed saving. Uh, these are going to be self-pollinating plants that produce seeds that will grow to have most of the same characteristics as the parent. Or there are going to be proper, uh, excuse me, cross-pollinated plants that were grown with proper isolation um, that will have most of the same characteristics. Um, these open pollinated cultivars are going to make seeds that are going to look a lot like the parents, but that's only if isolation was um, a factor. Um, and again, like I said, we're going to get into what, what does that isolation mean? Um, we'll get into that in a, in a, in a minute here. Uh, heirlooms is another thing you'll see on the front of a seed packet. Um, what this means is it's an open pollinated plant that's got some kind of history behind it. Usually it means that they have passed down these traits for at least 50 years uh, in order to be labeled an heirloom. Uh, sometimes people call them old fashioned varieties. Um, some of the drawbacks of heirlooms, well, we, know, we all know the uh, good things about heirlooms is that they taste delicious usually. Um, they tend to be less disease resistant though. So especially in the case of tomatoes, um, your heirlooms may be the ones that are succumbing to early blight and late blight um, or different kinds, different other kinds of funguses or bacterial diseases, viruses, um, but they are going to be more flavorful. I tend to plant one hybrid variety and an heirloom variety, um, just in case. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> um, but still here, even if you're planting an heirloom variety or something that's labeled open pollinated, because you can see heirloom is open pollinated, um, your isolation distance is still going to be important here, especially in something that has um, insect, insect pollination. Um, so hybrids, uh, so these are sometimes called F1 varieties. They are not for seed saving. These are uh, plant cultivars that are specifically selected and bred 
and um, it crosses two different plants. Uh, seeds that you save from a hybrid are not going to reproduce true to type. So my better boy tomatoes that I plant because of the disease resistance, um, if I harvest seeds from that and plant them, more than likely I'm going to get like a cherry tomato out of it or some kind of really odd, not white tasting right tomato plant. So um, a lot of these seeds too are usually owned or patented. So you're gonna see a label on that seed packet that says that you're not supposed to save seeds um, from the children of that. Honestly, probably most of them are not gonna produce true to type anyway. So it doesn't, doesn't matter much. <laughs> um, the example with tomatoes, that Better Boy Hybrid is gonna be labeled VFN. Um, anytime you see letters in capital like that after a hybrid name, it's usually referring to some kind of um, disease resistance. So in this case, a VFN tomato is resistant to verticillium wilt, fusarium wilt, and nematodes. Um, so GMO or GE is the, the next label for plant for seeds that you may see. Um, they are also not for seed saving. Um, they are genetically modified organisms, so they've uh, had its genetic material altered by some means of genetic engineering. And I just wanna make this really clear, there are no GMO seeds available for the home gardener. Farmers can buy GMO corn or soybeans or a specific type of seed that they're growing for commercial purposes or for research on their farm. But that purchase comes along with a contract agreement with information on how to grow care, how to harvest, how to save seeds or not save seeds. So if your seed packet says non-GMO, it really doesn't mean anything because you can't buy GMO seeds as a home gardener anyway. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're, as you're buying your seeds. Okay, so now what everyone wants to get to is to talk about plants and what, what does this mean? So, um, so at the Jefferson Public Library Seed Saving Library there, we have... Um, seed saving levels uh, assigned to the different types of seeds. And what this means is if you've never saved seeds before, you can rate yourself as a beginner and check out beginner seeds. We've kind of rated the, the different seeds to help you guys know which ones require more or less work as far as um, cr preventing cross-pollination. So, Easy seeds are generally self-pollinated plants, and usually they don't require too much effort to harvest the seeds. Examples of these are pea and lavender. So also the plants have a growing um, difficulty level assigned to them too, whereas pea is pretty easy to grow. Lavender, if you've ever tried to start lavender seeds, they're just, they're, they're very, very finicky and they want very specific moisture and very specific temperature in the soil and then they take a really long time to uh, germinate. So, um, so we label the difficulty of the plant to grow as well, especially for um, unseasoned gardeners that maybe don't have a lot of experience with growing the seeds. Um, so some self-pollinated plants include the Fabaceae family, beans and peas. Those are the ones that I was telling you before, like everything inside that flower, um, the male and female parts are inside there and they aren't really, there's not really even anywhere for the bee to get into the pollen. Uh, also the Asteraceae family, lettuce, endive, chicory, radicchio. Um, this is also the sunflower family, if you recognize um, that flower shape there. Um, the Asteraceae family, this is an inflorescence and the actual flowers are these little teeny tiny things in the center. So one sunflower is made up of hundreds of actual flowers um, on the inside and, and those actual flowers are so tiny that they are more so self-pollinating than they are cross-pollinating. Um, and then the Solanaceae family, so that's tomatoes. Um, heirlooms tend to cross-pollinate more so than the hybrid, or than a hybrid, but a hybrid you can't save seeds from. So um, just keep that in mind that there, there is some isolation distance with tomatoes. So isolation distance means you don't want to plant them 
too close together. Um, I've got a, uh, a spreadsheet that I'll show you guys at the end, a, a pretty good resource for isolation distances. Um, Elizabeth at the seed library has, when you check out a tomato seed, it's going to have listed on there if, if there's an isolation distance that needs to be uh, taken into account. Uh, she'll put that put that on there. But most of these easy seeds, that they're, they're more so going to self-pollinate. I think the isolation for heirloom tomatoes was like six feet or something like that if I recall correctly. I don't I don't remember if I wrote it down on this presentation. Um, but more so the, the pollen tends to not travel very far in self-pollinated plants. It's going to be less than 20 feet and it's going to be under really uncommon circumstances that you're going to have pollen moving between these plants. So the next level up is medium. Um, these are going to be seeds where if you've saved seeds before, you know how to do a little work with cross-pollination, to prevent cross-pollination. Um, you might, you understand the basics of um, the, the different species that are going to cross-pollinate, then you can rate yourself medium, and you can check out beginner or medium seeds, and some of these include lettuce and parsley. So these can be pollinated by wind. Um, gram the graminae grass family, as in corn, is pollinated by wind. And the, uh, I can never say this one, Amaranthiae, Amaranthiae family, um, which is beets, Swiss chard, and spinach. So um, it's, it's kind of hard to believe, but beets, Swiss chard, and spinach, they can, uh, many of them can, can pollinate within each other. So beets and Swiss chard can cross-pollinate together. Um, and also the the pollen is so tiny that it can just float on the wind for one to three miles. Um, so these can be pretty difficult to seed save, um, mainly because you're going to have to do a lot of work. You're going to you're going to need to make you know, you're going to need to know what your neighbors are growing. <laughs> you're going to need to um, possibly put up some. Um, barriers. So your isolation distance, like I said, the pollen is really fine. It travels on the wind. These are questions that almost you need to have answered for your plants in order to um, to know that you've prevented cross-pollination. Cross also your prevailing wind direction can have an effect. So if your wind normally travels from east to west and your your neighbor has beets planted to the west, then you, you may have less cross-pollination. Now your neighbor is going to have more cross-pollination because your beet pollen is going to blow into his beet pollen, um, but your, your beets are going to be um, better suited for seed saving than uh, your neighbors. Um, you can do some physical barriers, so these are not guaranteed solutions by any means. None of this is. It's the wind. We can't control the wind. Um, but you can have some wind barriers with shrub and tree lines, fences, Sometimes with some covers, you can you can um, cover the plants so that pollen doesn't travel in. Um, but some examples of isolation distances for beet, it's 3,200 feet. And that means that you should not have another variety of beet plant within 3,200 feet. Now the pollen is, can still travel one to three miles for some for, for these plants, but um, Typically, with a, with a certain size population of beet plants, you're not going to have cross-pollination cross happening if the plants are more than 3,200 feet apart, the different varieties. So you could plant a field of beets, and as long as no one else had one within about 3,000 feet of you, then um, your beets would probably be okay for seed saving. Corn is about 1,600 feet. Those of you who've planted corn before know that um, you're going to do better off planting a, you know, four rows of corn than you are one, one row, one long row of corn because of pollination. And the corn at the side that the wind comes from is going to tend not to be as well pollinated as the corn further in. And that's because it's pollinated by wind. It, the tassels at the top drops pollen down and as the wind blows it, it's blown across the, across the field. Um, and spinach is the same way. Spinach is um, about 3,200 feet for cross-pollination. Um, 
Beet and spinach are typically ones that we don't allow to go to flower. So um, if your neighbor is growing beets, and but they're growing beets to harvest them and not save seeds, um, he's not, he doesn't have to worry about cross-pollination at all. Um, but again, to, for you, if you are saving seeds, you want to make sure that you're um, taking into account how, how the pollen is traveling around your plant. So um, if that doesn't sound difficult enough, um, <laughs> there is actually a difficult level of seed saving. So um, these are seeds that require a great deal of um, effort to save the seeds. It can require hand pollination, tenting, um, or they have even, they don't have as far of a distance like the uh, wind pollinated plants for um, isolation but they still have some pretty, um, pretty big isolation distances. Um, just the one example I had here was sweet pepper. So um, this pollen can still travel one to two miles. You can think about a, a bee, bees tend to, honeybees tend to browse around about a, a mile around from their hive. So this is, you can still have a good, a good movement of, of pollen here. And this is really going to be like every other garden plant that we haven't already mentioned. So asparagus, the amaryllidaceae family, onions, shallots, and leeks, the apiaceae family, carrot, celery, parsley, dill, and parsnips. Uh, the ones with stars are um, biennials, so you're going to have to wait two growing seasons in order to, to see it flower. The brassicaceae family, broccoli, brussels, sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, Chinese cabbage, collard, radish, rutabaga. The cucurbitaceae family, cucumbers, melons, watermelons, summer squash, zucchini, pumpkin, winter squash, and the solanaceae family, peppers and eggplants. Um, so these are, they just, they just are, they're just difficult to seed save. Um, some of that means, you know, the cucumbers, for example, you just can't plant multiple varieties of cucumbers and you can't plant any melon that may cross with that cucumber. Um, so you just have to be really specific, make sure that you know your plants uh, before you plan your garden, know which ones you are growing to save seeds from um, with, with this group of plants. Again, isolation distance is important in prevention. So how far is an insect gonna fly to get to another flower? Um, there's some talk of if a, if an in, if a bee can't physically see the bloom of another in, of another plant. So a squash flower in your garden versus a squash flower in another, if there's a fence, the, the bee won't go there. I, I don't know, I don't, I, don't, I don't see from a bee, so I, don't, I, I can understand some of the thought process of that, but all the bee has to do is fly up over the fence and it sees the flower. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't completely trust if the bee can't see it that they can't that they won't go to it um maybe if you had your own bees and you kind of could watch and see that they aren't you they have enough food there in your garden that they don't have to leave possibly um and of course the second bullet do you know if the insect has visited a plant earlier and captured compatible pollen of course you don't know that like this that's why this is difficult is because we don't know what plants the insect has visited and we don't know where that insect is going um some physical barriers so you can hand pollinate and bag blooms uh if you greenhouse grow you obviously do have to hand pollinate because you don't have the pollinators uh, visiting inside the greenhouse uh, some of those examples for isolation distances, um, the Amaryllidaceae family is about 1,600 feet. Um, actually, almost all of these are 1,600 feet. Um, I see I forgot to put uh, information for the Bra Brassicaceae family there. Um, and Cucurbitaceae. Uh, I'll show you guys a resource uh, that you can use to help when you're planning your garden for these uh, isolation distances. But basically, these are all, all things that we grow a lot. Oh, there's a brass casey. So um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, kohlrabi, and kale. They're all Brassica oleracea. That's their genus and species name. Um, it's all the same plant. 
it's just they were bred by selecting specific features in order to make certain plants. So you can see kale was selected for the leaves. So Brascolaracea grew and they said, hey, that one's got big leaves. They taste really good. Let's let's breed more, let's breed that one with this one that also has really nice leaves. And eventually they got kale, where if you plant kale seeds, it grows kale. Uh, same with broccoli, it's the stems and the flowers is what um, what people liked in it. And so they bred bro broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, all of it. But if you plant all these at the same time in your garden and they all bloom at the same time, you're going to have pollen crossing between them. And so the seeds you save are going to be um, possibly cross-pollinated seeds and they may not produce kale. It may produce kind of a franken, franken cabbage or kale that, that or it just may revert and it may look more like that wild brassicolaracea um, that you can kind of see growing along the sides of the road. Um, so I've marked stars on these. All the ones that are starred can intercross with each other. Radish and rutabaga are separate um, separate species. It's not brassicolaracea, so you're not going to have any crossing with those. Um, I mentioned hand pollination. I didn't get into it because I knew I had some pictures here. So um, you can prevent cross-pollination by hand pollinating plants. So basically the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna prevent a bee from entering a flower by closing the blossom. Bees get active with the sun coming up, so that means you gotta get up early. I'm not an early riser, so um, it's probably not gonna happen in my garden. <laughs> um, so here you can see we have a female flower next to a male flower. Um, Basically what they're doing is they're clipping, but you obviously wouldn't clip the female flower. They're just put, we just have the picture there so that you can see the male from the female. Um, you're gonna clip the male flower and pull the, the petals back or clip the petals off all together to expose the anther there. And then you're going to, almost like a paintbrush, paint it onto the stigma um, of the female flower. Uh, then you're going to close the female flower either with the paper clip method that they have here, um, or you can bag with a, um, you can bag the flower with these little bags that, uh, I, I've bought them from the dollar store, from Dollar Tree before, I'm sure you can order them, um, but they have a little drawstring on them so you can pull it, pull it snug over the flower. Um, it's also a great way to capture seeds, um, which I think, uh, Beth and I, or Elizabeth and I were talking about uh, the next, the May seed saving library about how to save seeds. So this is one of the, one of the methods of capturing seeds on flowers and um, things like that, because you can, you can bag it and when the seeds dry out, they just drop right into the bag. But in hand pollination, you're bagging it because you don't want a bee to come by and drop different pollen into that, into that flower. So what you can do is pick a flower that you want to produce a fruit for uh, seed saving. So you see they have a tag hanging on this. You're gonna wanna tag your fruit, uh, tag that blossom so that you know, and remember that, as, let's face it, I can't hardly remember to get onto a meeting right now, so I'm not gonna remember which fruit I hand pollinated. Um, you're gonna need to remember which fruit you control the pollination for. So you can tag a couple fruits in your garden. Then the ones that aren't tagged, you, you harvest those, you eat those. You're, you know, you're, not, you're not trying to save to allow those seeds to mature um, for you to be able to harvest them. Um, so this is not something that you would do on your entire crop of zucchini squash. This is gonna be something you select from a couple healthy plants, um, tag the blossoms, tag the, um, close the blossoms to prevent any insects and any other pollination from happening. Um, so that's hand pollination. Whoops, oh, here we go. Um, so kind of the, the, the short summary of what this whole presentation I hope has shown you is that with the exception of self-pollinators, only grow one variety of a plant from which you want to save seed that season. Um, 
if, if you're willing and able to do that hand pollination and prevention of insect pollinated plants, um, then you can grow more than one variety, but you do need to make sure you're out there before the flower opens so that you can uh, close it and make sure that no bee gets in there to um, trade around some pollen. So, um, so that's basically the end of what I have. Uh, this is just our extension web page and phone number. You can call that or go to the web page and search and find uh, the Jackson County office. Um, we're all we're still on Facebook. We're still answering emails and phone calls. So um, feel free to continue to call and use the office. Uh, we can still do soil testing. We have a contactless method in order to drop off samples. So if you uh, do need to do a soil test still, we can still do that. And then um, this is my, I know it's really, really long, but this is my Master Gardener Gmail. So if you have questions that you wanna ask, um, maybe that aren't seed saving related or, um, or they are, but you don't wanna ask here in the meeting, um, you can write that down. That, that email address is also on the, seed, the Jefferson Library seed saving page so that you can click it and not have to type it all down, um, or write it all down. But we, um, the reason it's so long is because there's a Jackson, Georgia. <laughs> um, so we had to put Jackson County, Georgia, and then uh, Master Gardener. So uh, hopefully you guys learned something. If you have questions, um, let me know, or we can unmute and we can, we can talk um, about whatever problems you guys have. I think everybody can unmute themselves. So if you wanna, if you want to, you can. I see Bobby says that he um, lost some of his winter veggies due to snails possibly. That's, that's possible, especially as wet as it's been. Um, yeah, so survivors were no clean next to garlic plants. I haven't heard of garlic specifically being a deterrent for snails, but um, I mean, it, it's, it's possible. We could look into that some more. Um, with snails and slugs, the, the best thing to do to prevent them from being in your garden is to remove a place for them to live during the day. So they're not going to travel terribly far to get to your plants, but if you have um, stones that they can they can hide under or pieces of wood that they can can get under during the day when it's hot, um, that is going to encourage them to hang around your garden some more. Um, the beer traps actually does work for snails. So you can take like a yogurt cup and kind of bury it down into the soil. Um, so at soil level and pour whatever cheap beer you have that you're willing to give to the snails um, and put it down, put pour it into that cup and, and the snails are attracted to the, to that smell and they will, the slugs and snails will, will drown in it. I have a question, Brandy. Yeah. For um, preventing cross-pollination with flowers, isolation distance isn't always possible because our neighbors are growing flowers and a lot of us live in subdivisions. Okay. Is there a good um, alternative method that can be done for saving uh, seeds for flowers? It's only that hand pollination. That's really the only thing that you can do is get out there before the bees are active. Um, they're not going to be active until the sun comes up and it gets, they get some warmth because insects are cold blooded. And so um, if it's warm out and it's a warm night, you might see them out even earlier. Um, but right now, especially, um, they're not, they're not out and active until, um, until after the sun gets up. Um, you just have to clip you know, close those blooms so that insects, the, you know, the bees can't get to it and then go get male pollen from a, from a plant and, and hand pollinate it, bag it or, or seal the flower back up. So the fruit, the fruit, the seeds can produce in there. How would you know if it's a male flower? Like, like <laughs> let's just talk zinnias. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think zinnias are, um, they have both parts in, in the plant. So we'll have to, we would have to look that one up in particular. Um, and we have to look up whether the plant requires a different 
individual to pollinate. So some plants, I didn't even get into this, that some plants, they're not receptive to their own pollen. So they may produce male and female parts, but they're not, they can't accept their own pollen. They need pollen from another individual plant. Um, so it's really on a, a plant by plant basis that you have to uh, study and know the biology of that plant in order to intervene and prevent cross-pollination. Um, I, I know from experience that zinnias, they do, they just kind of cross-pollinate with whatever and that's honestly why mostly what you see in the stores are zinnia mixes because you just get all kinds of stuff from them. <laughs> but they're all zinnias. They just, in order to grow it as a specific variety, your isolation distance has to be pretty big. And then what the farmers are doing that are growing those crops is the ones on the outside of the isolation distance that are maybe closer to another zinnia patch. Um, those go into the seed mixes and the ones in the center that meet the isolation guidelines are the, you know, whatever pure zinnia variety, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes. It's not easy. <laughs> I don't have an easy solution. If you were to bag the zinnia bloom before it opened, um, it would depend. I don't know zinnia in particular, whether it needs a different individual or the same, you know, it's receptive to its own pollen. But if it's receptive to its own pollen, you, you could potentially bag the bloom before it opens, but you would still have to go out there and, you know, give, give that flower a good shake to, um, to get the pollen moving around in it so that it can it can be pollinated. If anyone else has any questions, you can type them into the chat or uh, I think Brandy said you can unmute yourself yeah. and just ask them. There's not too many of us in here, so it's not gonna be too chaotic. <laughs> Oh, I have another question. Okay. So I am trying black eyed peas and asparagus beans um, this year, which if I remember correctly, they both have the same um, scientific name. Uh, so, and they're, and they're about eight feet apart. I think you uh, mentioned in your, your um, presentation that I think both those varieties are fall in the self pollinating flower category. Is that far enough apart so that the pollen won't mix and I could save seeds for both of those um, plants? Uh, it should be. Let's, um, I'm going to go open up this um, resource that I, that I said I was going to do and I forgot to show it. So um, this is the Seed Stavers Exchange and I'm going to put it into the chat box so that if you want the Oh, I thought it was. Where's the chat box? There it is. Um, if you guys want that link, it, it's uh, a pretty good all-in-one place chart for um, for vegetable gardening. Let's put it that way. It doesn't have a lot of the, um, it doesn't have any ornamental type flowers um, in it, but um, you could you could study some of the pieces of this chart and make some educated guesses about ornamental flowers. Um, but again, if you can find a resource that, um, and I think Elizabeth has a book that um, I suggested to her in the, in the library. So once the library is back open again, um, it's a great resource for isolation distance and all this life cycle information for some of those uh, annual flowers uh, that, that we like to grow as well. So, um, Cow peas are, is typically what the black eyed peas is. Is that the genus and species that you yes, recall? That is cool. Yeah. So, um, so this will show you cow peas, uh, genus and species, their pollination are, are self and insects. Life cycles A, so down at the bottom of this list, it's an annual. B is biennial. Um, 
the next column, I'm going to go ahead and just look at these definitions here and then we'll flip back up. So VS is very self-pollinating, S somewhat self-pollinating. Uh, SO is can be self-pollinating, but will oft outbreed as well. O is mostly outbreeding. That means it's not using its own pollen. Um, VO means it requires outbreeding. So that's where I was saying uh, some plants are not receptive to their own pollen and they require a separate individual. So that's considered outbreeding. Um, so let's look back at cowpeas. So it's SO, which was can be self-pollinating, but is often outbreeding. So in that case, I would not save seeds from those unless they were 160 feet apart, which is that isolation distance there. All right. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> and I think I have this on the website. If I don't, I will um, add a link to this as well. Yeah, this is a pretty good, it's two pages. It's one that um, if you're, if you're going to actively seed save, it'd be a good print front and back and maybe even laminate it and stick it with your gardening resources. Just, just because it has so much information kind of compacted into two pages. Um, this is going to tell you population size. So that is, um, it's a commercial production size with the isolation that's needed in order to produce, you know, good quality seeds. Um, obviously, if you're home gardening, you're gonna you're not gonna plant 40 cowpea plants in order to save seeds from it. So, um, but you're uh, you can you can you're going to have better quality seeds the more individuals, especially with these you know outbreeding plants. You're gonna have better quality seeds if you have more plants. Um, but for, for home gardening purposes, no, by no means are we saying you have to plant 40 plants. Um, this column here where seed maturity is um, market or aftermarket. So market for a bean is we eat the beans. So what you find at the grocery store is market. So some, some common beans, you can plant the seeds. The seeds are mature at market. They can also be mature after market. So you guys know you can dry bean seeds and they're good after market. Um, so cilantro here has a thing and it's good after market when it's coriander. And obviously if you're harvesting cilantro for the seed, for the leaves, you're not going to be getting seeds until it actually makes those seeds. Um, I'm trying to find one that's just market. So pumpkin, obviously pumpkin seeds come from inside the pumpkin and you can harvest a pumpkin when you're carving it and save all the seeds out of it and plant them. So, um, they can also be, I think, I would think they could be aftermarket too, but yeah. Uh, this last column here for notes, uh, this is a good like I said, it's a good resource for knowing when things can cross so that you don't have to memorize all of those uh, um, genus and species names. So here's broccoli crosses with other B period oleracea. So instead of writing brassica oleracea over and over, um, you'll often see that when they refer to brassica oleracea, they'll just um, shorten the genus name to just the first letter and a period. Um, carrot crosses with Queen Anne's lace. Celery crosses with celeriac. Um, Swiss chard crosses with beets. Uh, it says here leeks are very short-lived seeds. So it's going to give you a lot of these, um, these information about crossing. I know that Beth and I, or Elizabeth and I worked on a lot of um, information on pumpkin because there are some cucur cucurbita species that will cross and some that don't cross and so um, we have we've worked on a lot a lot of those again summer squash like I was telling you guys your green zucchini squash is cucurbita pepo and your yellow squash is also cucurbita pepo and those will cross within each other and even your winter squash will cross with your summer squash because of that genus and species name. If it's Cucurbita pe pepa, <laughs> there is also winter squash that's Cucurbita maxima and Cucurbita moshata. And I, I haven't even seen that one, but uh, Agriosperma. So um, knowing the genus and species names is not fun, but uh, 
it's it's important in your planning for seed saving, knowing what your genus and species is. And you can see here all these squashes are oh, they're they're outbreeding. They're you've got and if you've ever sat and watched the uh, bees flying around your your squash blossoms, you know that they just go here to here to here to here to here to here to here. Um, bees in their their biology is they kind of pick a flower and they commit to that flower for a period of time. Um, the comparison, I use this with kids a lot, is, you know, a butterfly is just kind of flitting and, and floating and just visiting whatever flower fits its fancy. Um, bees are like on a mission. Like they go flower, 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 flower. They will visit every flower on a plant and then go to the very same plants next, next to it and visit every flower on the plant. So bees are pollinating machines because they are focused. They have like a goal in mind to collect as much pollen as possible and they 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 like it to be the same pollen um, which is great for plants because plants need the bees and especially these that outbreed to bring pollen to various individuals. But that's kind of why it's difficult for us who who really do like and enjoy seed saving to make sure that some of these species that are outbreeding or not, um, I don't want to call it contaminated by pollen, but I mean, if it's, if you have summer squash planted and another winter squash that's a cucurbit of pepo, you're going to, the, the bees are going to visit all of them. And if any cucurbit of pepo pollen is dropped on the other cucurbit of pepo, it's going to be receptive to that pollen. Sorry, that was a really long uh, explanation, but hopefully, hopefully that helps. And like I said, this is a great, a great resource. I haven't found anything quite like it for flowers. Um, I did find a book again that I recommended to Elizabeth at the library to uh, to get as a resource. So they do have that there. Um, but you can find you can find some of the information online for for flowers. Are there any, any other? Also on the, oh, go ahead. Oh, you're good. Also on the website, on the growing tips and the seed saving tips, it will have all of that information as well for every seed in our catalog. So if you're planting anything that's in our catalog, it will have that information. Sure. Yeah. Are there? I was going to show that. Are there any other questions? Oh. So I think it's under this how to save seeds and then if you click beet it should bring up um, our information about about the beets. So here it says beets will cross with other beta vulgaris like Swiss chard and should be separated by a mile. So if you're checking out seeds or have checked out seeds from the library you'll get this little little packet with it. You can also look at this for resource too. Uh, Elizabeth types them up and sends them to me and we take a look at what resources, I take a look at what resources I have and um, check the distances and things like that. So, so yeah, we do have a lot of the flowers there that we've checked from that book that I, re that I suggested to Elizabeth. I do want to let everyone know we are going to do another Zoom meeting uh, for May for a seed library. Uh, as long as things don't change, that will be the plan. And we'll be talking about um, actually sh saving seeds, showing some demonstrations of how to do that. Um, so hopefully it'll be pretty practical for everyone. Yep. And that will be May 16th at 10 o'clock. All right. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? All right. Well, I appreciate everyone um, taking some time out of your Saturday morning to join us for our Zoom Seed Library from the Jefferson Public Library.
And I uh, thank you all and hopefully uh, you'll be able to come out in May. Yep. Thank you. Bye everyone.